Uh, let's, let's welcome Dr. Atta Gibril, okay, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, and uh, sorry about that. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, con misconceptions about assessment, and it seems that many of the misconceptions we hear about technology are not misconceptions, they're facts. So uh, anyway, um, let me uh, give you an idea first about my background, probably that would help you understand why I'm talking about this and what kind of personal experiences I've been through encountering many of these misconceptions. I got my degree in language testing from the University of Iowa. And while being there, I worked as a research assistant for American College Testing, basically working on business English uh, package, assessment package. And also at the same time, I got my uh, uh, certification in oral proficiency interviewer. I've worked as a proficiency interviewer for ACTFUL and ILR, ILR skills, if you're familiar with these uh, two. Also, I've worked on assessment uh, projects in um, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Australia, and also we're working now on a project, um, assessment literacy in Egypt, funded by Educational Testing Service. And um, I have Betsy here, one of the uh, uh, great contributors to that. The uh, to that project. And I'll start um, talking about the rumors we hear every day about assessment. And probably it's a good idea to get some of these rumors from the audience. What are the most common rumors we keep hearing about assessment in general and, and, and tests? They're not, They're not accurate? OK. What else? They're not beneficial. beneficial. OK. Automatic success. Yes. Just automatic success for students. So automatic success. OK. Uh, not consistent across Not consistent board. across the board in terms of people, in terms of context, in terms of formats or forms. <clears throat> Have nothing to do with real life, right? Waste of time. Let me share with you some thoughts that I have about um, the misconceptions. Have you ever heard some of these? I know someone who picked option C on MCQ test and got a high score. Have you heard that one? <laughs> or something, I heard that Ahmed can not speak a single word in English and he got 100 on TOEFL IBT. That's very common, right? Um, anyone can write multiple choice questions. So if, you know, if you go to anyone, you can, well, uh, there is one thing I have to talk about or I have to warn you about now. Um, when we talk about misconceptions, we talk about misconceptions at different layers. And I'm talking about different teachers, different experiences, different people. So a, a misconception for someone probably is not a misconception for you. but. I've met people who, talk, who think that multiple choice questions are very easy to write. Anyone can write them. Yeah. Um, teachers do not need training and assessment. It's an art. It's not a science. Well, we'll talk about this. And exams are not fair. And I think somebody mentioned something about the exams are not fair. Um, My purpose today is to distinguish between facts and yes, exactly. And um, uh, probably something I should have mentioned earlier, I'm working now on a book that will be published by the University of Michigan Press, and hopefully it will be out in 2014, talking about assessment myths and why these misconceptions happen all the time. And we're trying to debunk some of these misconceptions in the book. Uh, so my purpose today is to try to debunk some of these misconceptions and try to clarify why this happens all the time and what we need to do as educators in general, as English language, or we have French here, so let's say, as language professionals, what we should do in order to avoid many of these misconceptions. And, uh, uh, 
Another thing I want to say, uh, it's not the purpose here to explain every single point. The purpose today is to raise awareness and provide guidelines for people in the field in order to avoid these misconceptions. Hopefully, if, if we have more opportunities in the future, we'll talk about every single point and probably we need at least a couple of weeks to finish with this. Uh, and of course, during the next couple of years, we have more uh, uh, sessions on assessment. And one more thing I want to say before moving on, that we're planning to have the special interest group as part of Nile TESOL on assessment. And uh, if you're going to attend uh, Nile TESOL in January, please attend our session on establishing the uh, Testing, Evaluation, and Assessment Special Interest Group, the T. We call it T Special Interest Group. Um, misconceptions usually are very serious, and we need to work on them for the reasons we have on these slides. Misconceptions can negatively aff affect our perceptions of assessment and the way we look at exams, the way we look at how we do things in assessment. So it's very important for us as educators to make sure that people working in the field understand that these are just misconceptions and we have to be careful about generalizing. Of course, there is some truth. Perhaps there is some truth to that misconception somehow, but we need to differentiate between facts and, as I said, and misconceptions. The other one, can affect our assessment practices. If I have a wrong idea about a specific technique, probably say multiple choice is bad. I'm not going to use it in my classes. I'm not going to use it with my students because I just I don't believe in the usefulness or practicality of that technique. And we try as much as possible to tell people, well, for multiple choice, you have to understand that the problem with multiple choice has nothing to do with the question type. It has to do with the item, it has to do with the item writer, the person who writes bad items. Misconceptions can affect the implementation of assessment policies in schools. You know why we have problems with assessment policies in schools? Because we don't prepare teachers. The only thing we, do, we, we keep doing all the time, we invite them for workshops, and we provide more info, more knowledge, but we don't work on beliefs. I mean, whatever you're gonna tell me about something, regardless whether the presenter is great, regardless whether the content of the workshop is fantastic, I'm not going to buy into this unless I believe in that specific part. And we don't, we, we don't do a good job when it comes to changing the belief system of teachers. Yes. The uh, other one, and I think uh, I'd like actually to thank Eric for helping me because what he mentioned uh, uh, during his presentation would help me a lot in laying out some of the issues I'll, I'll be talking about today. And I think he referred to the relationship between learning and assessment. In what we do in assessment, we try to uh, gather information about whether we've achieved our objectives or not. We would like to look into uh, the learning outcomes. And this is what we do in assessment. We gather evidence, we gather information to assess whether we've achieved the objectives, the learning outcomes or not. So it's very important to have a good idea about what assessment is all about to make sure that we're doing a, job, a good job with learning in classes. Okay. Well, now we'll talk about misconceptions. And I'll, uh, I'll talk about, about five misconceptions. Of course, we have more in the book. I'm not trying to market the book or anything, but it's just um, I picked the most relevant misconceptions we have uh, in our context. The first misconception, teachers don't need to take assessment training. And I mentioned earlier about the fact that as a teacher you can write items, you can score, you can grade assignments, you can develop scoring rubrics, but why should I go through that training? Um, 
Of course, some of you in the room might disagree with that misconception. And of course, as professionals, we think that assessment is needed. But there are people out there in the field who every single day are involved in assessment activities. And by the way, the literature refers to the fact that around 40% of the teaching related activities, 40%, that part, has to do with assessment. But usually assessment training takes a back seat. And the literature all the time refers to the fact that we're, no, we're not doing a good job with assessment training for teachers. And uh, here is a quotation I got from Stiggins saying that if teachers don't understand how to produce quality assessment and use them well, their students are placed directly in harm's way. We're hurting our students by doing that. Because there is a saying in statistics in general, garbage in, garbage out. If you're collecting garbage, the outcome will be garbage. And, uh, most, uh, and uh, again, going back to the idea that uh, Eric mentioned, uh, the misconception that assessment is not accurate. Well, there's some truth to that. Because of the, uh, we're using assessment tools that are not good enough, that don't produce quality information. Because the academic well-being of the student hangs in the balance, excellence in classroom assessment is a must. So we must ask, are we the teacher education faculty in our institution contributing to excellence in classroom assessment? And Shepard also calls for not only teaching assessment courses, but also including assessment as part of your methods course. If you're, you're teaching a, te a teacher, if you're, I mean, educating teacher candidates, probably it's a good idea to talk about assessment in your methods course. What we do in Egypt, if you look at the kind of scenarios we have here in Egypt, scenario number one, no assessment classes. In many of the colleges of education, you don't have a single course in assessment. In some places, they might have a course, but they offer this course in a one-size-fits-all kind of format. So it's given to everyone, math, science, history, everyone. And that's not helpful. It, 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 somehow, it's helpful, but in some other aspects, it's not as effective as providing a course in language assessment. The third option is to introduce assessment as part of the methods course. But if you think about the methods course, probably, how many, how many weeks of classes will be uh, specified for uh, assessment, the assessment component in a methods course? Just one week. Just one week, right? Probably, if you're too optimistic, we're going to say a couple of weeks, right? Uh, so that's still a problem if you don't have a, a, an assessment course. Uh, this is an interesting uh, slide. Can you, can you read that? Th these are some, I'm oh, sorry. These are some of the skills that we need in assessment literacy. By the way, we usually use the word assessment literacy and I think Betsy is talking about assessment literacy today. So probably that would be a good introduction to her presentation. The three questions that you, we need to ask ourselves as professionals. What do I know and understand about assessment and testing? That's the first level. And I think we're okay with that. We know a lot of jargon, we know a lot of concepts about assessment. The next one, what do I do with what I know and understand about assessment and testing? That's a little bit problematic. Because if you ask many teachers to define what assessment is, they would give you a perfect definition. Testing, the same. Differentiate between testing, assessment, and evaluation. What is a proficiency test? What's a diagnostic test? What is uh, you know, uh, an achievement test. Everybody would give you a perfect definition. But if you move to the second part, the practical part, the practical aspect, that's a little bit problematic. Let's move to the third one. What do I do to improve what I do with what I know and understand about assessment and testing? That's confusing, isn't it? How can I apply? Here I'm talking about the professional development aspect. 
as a professional, do I reflect on what I'm doing? Am I trying to improve my assessment practices or not? And I think we have problems with these two. And in some contexts, we, ha we still have problems with this one. In many places, we still have problems. But even with people who know a little bit about assessment, the application aspect is still problematic. OK. I tried to look at the literature and to see whether the teachers are ready or not, whether they have assessment knowledge or not. And I'm talking still about level one. I'm not talking about the second or the third question that I talked about in the previous slide. I looked at the, a, report, a recent report, actually, by the National Council on Teacher Quality, and this is a, U, a, a US entity, indicated in a report on teacher preparation programs that teachers are not adequately prepared to effectively use assessment and make data-driven decisions. And here I'm talking about the US context. I'm not talking about the Egyptian context. The Egyptian con context is even worse now. And um, I try to come up with some reasons why this is happening. And I divided this into three areas, or three problems. The first one, problems with the content we offer in assessment courses and in assessment training. That, that part, I just, whenever I think about how we do things in a tra training, we're wasting a lot of time. Because we're not right, working on the right content, we're not working on the right skills. And it's just, you know, you get off the shelf materials and you try to use it without being sensitive to a number of issues. The teaching comp component in teacher education pro pro uh, programs is still problematic and I already talked about it. The third one, the sensitivity to local context. You know, we have to understand that uh, the local context is very important in terms of understanding assessment practices and also in terms of understanding assessment beliefs or the beliefs teachers have about assessment. And it, it, it's, it, the training sometimes is given by um, somebody who's not familiar with the local context. They start talking about things that are not relevant here. And um, if we look at the international context in terms of assessment, Egypt is considered as a high stakes assessment context, where assessment is very important, testing is very important. There are other places where assessment and tests are not given the same importance. Low stakes testing context are everywhere. And that's why we have to be careful and when we start talking about uh, specific techniques that have been used elsewhere and trying to use them in our local context. That's still problematic in, in many of the sessions and uh, uh, professional development workshops that I've, 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 I've participated in. Okay, um, I'll, sorry for moving a little bit quickly because uh, we're running out of time and I started almost like 15 minutes. Do I have time after 12 or I have to finish after? I don't like people to hate me. I know that is the, the, uh, the break will be at, at 12. Uh, yeah. You give me like 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. The second one I want to talk about is teachers need to need strong background in statistics to assess students. And for some reason, t teachers think that um, Statistics as a course is very important for, for, for people interested in working in assessment. That's true, but it's not completely true. You might need some statistics background if you're interested in working with language assessment. But if you look at the, lo the classroom context, many of the activities that we, part we participate in depend on qualitative judgment. If you look at many of the things that we do, if you're trying to develop your specifications, you're, if you're going to do item writing, you write items. If you do grading, that kind of 
work doesn't require any statistics or any background in statistics, right? But even with the quantitative part, I'll, I'll talk about this later. But uh, still, a lot of the things that you, you let's, let's, from your own example, if you work with tests, item writing doesn't need background in statistics. Um, uh, mod item moderation or reviewing items doesn't need any background in statistics. The grading itself, the specifications, these things do not need background in statistics. And um, that's why I don't understand this uh, panic that sometimes teachers have when they are assigned somehow some assessment uh, tasks. Because we, we don't really need statistics in assessment at the classroom level, I mean, to a certain degree. I'm not, I'm not trying here to generalize. Um, even if you need statistics, we're still at the descriptive statistics level. We don't require any inferential statistics. No, it's just descriptive statistics. I don't talk about descriptive statistics. I'm talking here about the mean standard deviation probably, right? And a couple of other indices that we use, item difficulty and item discrimination. Item difficulty is relatively straightforward. It just, it, even it, you don't go beyond uh, addition and multiplication when you, when you do uh, uh, item difficulty uh, analysis. Item discrimination, it's relatively also straightforward. Um, and by the way, there are certain now Excel spreadsheets with macros in these sheet, spreadsheets where the, the, that can help you uh, run a, a statistical analysis for item difficulty and item discrimination. So you don't need to do this by hand. So even your understanding of item difficulty and item discrimination, you need to understand this at the conceptual level. But you know, statistics-wise, you don't need any knowledge in statistics to do it. And I understand that some, some teachers are mathematically challenged. Uh, so uh, some of my friends, they call it mathematically disabled, but I try to be politically correct and stay mathematically challenged. <laughs> so uh, even with those people who are mathematically challenged, it's not, a, it's not a really uh, something important. There is a, well, you're right, exactly. And it's just, to me, um, it's a psychological barrier. I, I teach uh, my research class, and uh, uh, all the time when, it come, when we come to the quantitative part in this research class, and I'm not talking even about inferential statistics, I talk briefly about inferential statistics, and I see this panic from students about, well, are you going to include this in the final exam? Do we have to do this when we submit our assignment? Uh, uh, the thing I try to, um, uh, to say to them, try to be consumers, but good consumers, users of, of, of research uh, uh, we have out there. And I see the pattern when people r read research articles, they start with the introduction. Once they look at the tables, they just skip that part and go right away to the discussion section, right? Um, and uh, to me, it has nothing to do with statistics or mathematics. It has to do with the, the psychological barrier. And it, people sometimes, they like to stay in their comfort zone. They don't like to just push themselves a little bit. So it's an attitude thing. Um, th there is an excellent book actually written by Lyle Backman called Statistical Analysis in Language Assessment. And he starts in his introduction talking about statistics saying, Language testing is frequently associated with statistics in the mind of language educators. Often, for the very reason, language teachers feel that language testing is a somewhat alien discipline. I like the word alien. Language teachers have indeed often chosen their career in reaction against the scientific disciplines they experienced in their schools feeling that the arts and humanities are more in tune with their own interests, inclinations, and competences. And that's, that's true for many of the teachers I've encountered. Uh, but as I said, you don't really need statistics if you work with classroom assessment. The third misconception, um, and that's, that's my favorite, by the way.
language skills can only be tested separately. If I want to test writing, probably I'll ask them to write on the following topic. If I'd like to test speaking, give them a couple of questions. And I keep thinking, is that the way we use language every day? No. Definitely no. And if this is the case, why, and if we try to apply the basic assessment rules, authenticity is about reflecting reality, is about reflecting what we do in everyday life. And we're not helping our students in that aspect. And uh, probably that diagram looking at what people, we write, we listen, we speak, we read, we do uh, different things at the same time. And probably since my background in writing assessment, I'll give you this example about writing. And let's take the university context. Um, what we do in university classes, we ask to students to write papers, right? To go to the library and to somehow try to synthesize information from different sources. And probably they write a lab report in chemistry. And uh, in other places, probably they, they are assigned a topic. And then you ask them to check different sources. And then, as I said earlier, to synthesize in information. That kind of thing, that's academic writing, right? Look at the way that we assess academic writing. In many cases, in many places, they would give them this, this topic right on, and you fill in the blanks. And I keep asking, do students have background knowledge about the topic? Is that the way that they use writing in their uh, classes? No. And uh, that's why I think we're doing this students a disservice when we keep insisting on traditional practices because of what? Because of some misconceptions and because of some concerns we have about integrated task assessment or integrated language assessment that I'll be talking about during the next couple of slides. And the story said integrating the whole skills in teaching. And exactly, because uh, it's, uh, and that's the, that's the example that I uh, gave about academic writing. I mean, you ask students to write lab reports, to write research papers, to write book reviews, to write summaries, to write essays. And these things actually, when you depend on reading, and sometimes they depend on listening from their professor, or probably discussing with their professors and, and, uh, and, uh, and colleagues in classes. A very good example would be uh, an academic lecture. You go there as a student, you listen to the teacher, you take notes probably reading before coming to classes, and then speaking and discussing some of the concepts with the professor. So we'd like to reflect this in our, as a, yeah, exactly. And so we'd like to reflect this in our assessment practices. Uh, that's something actually that from uh, uh, the book that I told you about. Assessing language as an integrated ability has been gaining popularity in second and foreign language tests by combining reading and listening with writing or speaking. While there is still a standard practice to separate language into four skills for testing, integration is preferable in authentic testing of academic language ability and for several current approaches to language teaching. Um, that's, that's a quotation that I got from uh, uh, our uh, book. Um, here are the challenges or the concerns that people keep talking about. And I think we need to consider when we, uh, if we're planning to use integrated language assessment. Number one is score accuracy. Let's say if, we're, if we have a reading-based writing task. So you ask students to read and then write using the reading sources. The problem here, are we testing reading? Are we testing writing? Are we testing both? Do we have the right scoring rubric to use? Do we know the kind of criteria that we should consider when we, sc when we score these tasks? These are issues we need. They're not easy to answer. These questions are not easy to answer, but we need to think about them if we're planning to use integrated language assessment. The second one, task development is very tricky. Because 
And I'll give you also a, uh, an example from writing assessment uh, uh, context. If you're asking students to write on a topic based on reading some sources, probably it's a good idea to select a topic they're not, they're not, they're not familiar with. Why? Because they would go and consult the sources and then they would come and reflect. Otherwise, if you ask them to write about a topic that they're familiar with, probably they won't consult the sources while writing. Uh, again, you go to the kind of writing task, they would, is it an argumentative task, is it an expository task? Reading-based writing, sometimes it, it's more effective with a specific task other than ones. And there are guidelines in the literature if you're interested and can refer to, you a number, to a number of sources where you can read about task development and problems with task development and integrated assessment. The third one is scoring. My problem with many of the scoring rubrics that we have, including the scoring rubrics developed by major testing companies, with all due respect, they have problems with the way that they perceive integrated language assessment. Um, um, this is something we still we need more work on, and uh, there are uh, scoring rubrics in the pipeline coming out very soon what, that, that do reflect what we're really doing in, in integrated language assessment. The final one is textual borrowing, and probably this is more of an issue with writing, uh, with writing assessment, if you're working with integrated tasks in writing. You know when the students read sources and they try to use the sources in the writing? The problem, the way we teach writing, and if somebody mentioned something about impact affecting teaching, this is, this is positive washback. Hopefully, eventually, um, somehow enhancing integrated language assessment will result in better instruction in writing classes, in better learning in writing classes. How? In writing classes, we don't usually work a lot in discourse synthesis. We don't work a lot with how to paraphrase and how to uh, you know, consult different sources and how to do th things. And I'm talking here about academic writing at undergraduate level. Many of the writing classes that I've seen don't do a good job with discourse synthesis. And they work with discourse synthesis as some ha sort of you know, a threat rather than a, a resource that they can use in their classes. Eventually, this is an issue that would improve if we start enforcing these practices and start teaching and preparing our students for uh, tests that include integrated uh, writing tasks. And I've, I've seen the kind of test preparation materials with, for, developed mainly for TOEFL IBT, and I could tell that there is improvement in the way that we do things in, 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 in writing classes now because of that specific task. So there is positive washback when it comes to integrated writing assessment. But the thing is, we need to start. OK. Um, misconception number four, exams are unfair, are not fair. OK. Can you look at that picture and tell me what we have there? OK, I'll, I'll go in the back. You can see from here, right? Oh, OK. Impress, meaning like it's in the pipeline now. It has been accepted, but it has not been published yet. Okay. okay. Uh, then and then here. Okay. 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 Equality is relative. Depends. Uh huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Quality means the one uh, size fits all. Okay, size fits all, yep. Okay. 
Okay. Uh huh. Okay, equality is not always fair. Uh, regardless of individual differences. Okay. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you read this? Equality means sameness. Equity means fairness. And um, we have to understand that we're working with different types of people, different types of test takers, and we have to understand their needs. Is it an easy thing to do? No. But uh, the second question, are all exams unfair? The answer is no. And, uh, um, but we have to understand the logic behind fairness, and it's a very tricky term. And uh, sometimes as test takers, and also as testers, we don't have control over certain issues. There are certain issues that should be dealt with at the uh, national level or at the societal level, not at the professional level. Uh, and uh, that's something I wanna, I wanna talk about during the next couple of minutes. I'll skip the slide on, on the definition of fairness and I'll talk about briefly actually about the um, factors affecting fairness. That's a topic that probably it, uh, it might need a, a four or five day workshop. But, uh, so I'll try to be very brief in talking about this. Factors affecting fairness, something like gender, socioeconomic status, test form, students major, linguistic and cultural background. These are the things we need to consider when you write exams f for our st uh, students. Um, and there is a very essential idea that we need to consider when we uh, work on fairness, which has to do with the idea of access. One of them is financial access. You know, I keep thinking about the cost of international language tests now. We're talking about $150, $200. Can we do anything to help poor students? preparing for these exams, that's something probably we cannot do that much about at the, you know, at the local level. But definitely there are certain entities that should consider helping out. As a language tester, I cannot do anything about it. That's something, ha it has to do, with, uh, to me, it has to do with social justice. Yeah. And the, these issues should be dealt with within a, a social justice framework. The second one is the geographical axis. Looking back 20 years ago when I was in Suhag, and I used to travel to Cairo to take the TOEFL test. I took the TOEFL test a couple of times. And um, uh, things are getting better now with CBT and, I, well, and IBT because you know they have local centers everywhere now. But I'm in still certain areas I, I heard in the news the other day about Chinese students flying from China to Thailand to take the TOEFL test simply because they don't have enough centers in, in China. That's not fair. Um, so geographical access is an issue we need to look into. Personal access, and that's something we don't do a good job with. Uh, students with, or test takers with sp special needs. Sometimes we, what we have what we call test accommodations. We try to provide things for uh, you know, uh, people with special needs, but in some cases we don't have the infrastructure needed. And uh, we need to consider this when we write exams. Once I had a student who came to me before, right before the final exam and I said, you know what, I cannot read any font less than 36. And I said, I'm glad that you reminded me about that. And I, and I went and I printed out the exam. It was like a four page exam. It end, I ended up printing this in 40 pages. But the ramification, then I started thinking, okay, Somebody who would read 40 pages, should I give that person the same time given to other students with four pages? There are a number of issues that you, we need to consider when we talk about students with special needs. Educational access, and it drives me crazy when 
when people start, they start reporting statistics about how like white test takers are doing a better job than African Americans and Hispanic students. It has nothing to do with intelligence, it has nothing to do with anything, but it has to do with the local context. It has to do with the fact that usually poor students are located in poor neighborhoods with poor resources, poor schools, and they don't have enough money to hire the best teachers in the nation. Number two, they don't have money to pay for expensive test preparation kits, expensive test preparation materials, and that makes sense. And I, that, that's why I keep saying all the time, fairness also has to do with validity. Because in most cases, if you're not providing fair opportunities for uh, uh, students and test takers, that would come at the expense of validity because validity refers to the fact that the score will reflect the actual abil ability of the test taker. If we cannot ensure that the person is familiar with the test, we cannot ensure that the person will perform to his maximum ability on that test. It, it's education, it's culture, it's everything. Yes. Uh, you know what, I have one more uh, 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 misconception, but I'll stop here since we're running out of time. And I, I'd be more than happy I'll, uh, to answer any questions you might have. I mean, thank you very much for listening, and thank you. Okay, folks, here is the, the, I can take a, three minutes. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Final misconception, test preparation is bad. Test preparation is bad. And you know what? That's true, right? Is it true? Well, the thing is, let's define what we mean by test preparation. Okay? We have a number of concepts that we need to somehow look into here. Wash back, impact, teaching to the test, teaching for the test, curriculum alignment, teaching or item teaching, a number of concepts. Again, going back to the validity concept. Validity is about helping students perf show their best ability on the test. So I think from that perspective, test preparation improves the validity of our exams. But in terms of familiarizing students with the test and the test format, not teaching only or restricting teaching to only to testing activities. So we should not restrict our teaching on what we call item teaching or teaching to the test. But if we focus more on familiarizing students with item format, pr providing them with examples of things will be on the test, telling them, you know, showing them about how to work on multiple choice, how to work on this. But I'm not talking here about test wiseness because test wiseness is another, another area. And that's something we should discourage. Because test wiseness, well, in test one is what we try to do. We try actually to um, show students or provide students with strategies in order to answer questions that they don't know the underlying concept behind or the, the uh, knowledge domain behind that question. So basically based on, in Arabic, al-fahlawa, yani. Uh, we try to discourage that. So uh, I'll give you examples uh, for test-taking test strategies that we can work with, familiarizing students with different item formats, training students on how to approach different question types, practicing answer, uh, answering sample uh, questions, addressing scoring criteria, you tell them about the scoring criteria, and uh, how to time, uh, how to pace their test performance, according to the allotted or assigned time, and training students on how to do informed guessing rather than random guessing. So random guessing is not something encouraged, but uh, informed guessing is something that probably it's a good idea to... Did you keep 
educated. educated guessing, exactly. That's what I'm talking about here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.